Are you a security vendor with an innovative product and want to get in front of some inquisitive CISOs? Then you need to get excited for our new season of Capture the CISO. This is a unique competition where CISOs will watch your demos and then ask you questions on each episode. We get new CISO judges for each episode with winners moving on until an ultimate winner is chosen. CISOs get to learn about your products. Vendors can strut their stuff and the audience gets to be a fly on the wall for the entire process. If you want to be a competitor, be sure to email us about sponsoring Capture the CISO at info at CISOseries.com. Ten second security tip. Go. Tell your grandma to protect her email as the number one thing. Because of account recovery, you can get to everything else from email. That's the key. It's time to begin the CISO series podcast. Welcome to the CISO Series Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO Series and joining me, my co-host, you know him, unless this is your first time listening, maybe you don't know him, but it's Mike Johnson. He is the CISO of Rivian and the co-host of this very show. By the way, I know that you've been CISOs for three different companies since you started here, Mike. <laughs> it's, it's been quite the journey, David. Yeah. But it, really, that tells a lot about how long we've been doing this. Yes. Now, you and I have been doing the podcast for five years, more than five years, because it was June of 2018. But what I do want to mention is that we're going to be hitting the five-year anniversary of CISOseries.com, the address, which, by the way, if you have not gone there, you should go there right now. We will hit the five-year anniversary of that come October. And I'm going to just teasing that. And first, though, I do want to mention our sponsor, Vesa, who is, by the way, responsible for bringing our guest here today, who I will introduce also in a second as well. Secure your identity access, Vesa.com. More about that very topic a little bit later in the show. And we're going to be talking about identity more in the show. But I did want to just do a tease for our anniversary, which will be coming up less than a month from the day that this episode drops. While we were at Black Cat, I hired a camera crew. We were filming some Man on the Street videos, and uh, hopefully actually one will drop before this episode airs. But I got some testimonials from people. Oh, cool. And the question I asked them was, how has the CISO series impacted your career in security? And you'll be very pleased to know we got some spectacular responses to that question. That's awesome. Yes. That is so cool. That's why we do this, right? Is we want we want to help people out. So that's really cool to, to hear hear that feedback that really has impacted folks. We're gonna use every one of them. <laughs> every single one of them. We're somehow gonna squeeze them in. You're gonna now if they don't fall here in that one, you know, we'll do a kind of a compilation. If they don't appear in that, they're gonna appear somewhere else. You're gonna hear all the nice things people say about us. What was it? Uh, you have a high tolerance for compliments, David? Extremely high. You, you wouldn't believe what I, would, I, I could take while I was there. It was in, <laughs> spectacular. All right. I want to bring our guest in right now. Very thrilled to have them. And also thrilled to have their his company sponsoring us. It is our sponsor guest, who is the chief strategist over at Vesa, Rich Dandliker. Rich, thank you so much for joining us. It's fantastic to be here, David. They didn't think that through all the way, did they? Startups are, by nature, a risky business. Most fail. But why do they? Ross Haleluk, who is the head of product at Lima Charlie, posted on LinkedIn 12 reasons. And some of our favorites were building a product rather than building a business and having unrealistic expectations about distribution channels and customer adoption. Mike, what did you think of this list and what has been your experience watching startups succeed and fail? I think a lot of these really come down to two categories. One is product market fit or growing too fast. If I really were to just summarize the majority of Ross's list, it's, it's really those two things. And I would argue, though, that these are not specific to cybersecurity. These are reasons why startups fail full stop. 
But you know, this show is about cybersecurity, just so you know. So you can stay on that topic. I, I, I will <laughs> stay there. But I guess what I really try and remind folks is there's some things that are unique about cybersecurity and there's a lot that isn't. Mm -hmm. Some areas we are treading new ground and some you can actually look into the broader market and understand what's going on. One of the things that I think that was missing from his list that I do think might be a cybersecurity specific thing is he makes a point of they're building a product, not a company. Some of these companies are building a feature. Like that's all they're building a feature of a product of a company. Yes. And that's not going to go very far. So have certainly seen that. In, in a world where a lot of security leaders are looking for platform plays rather than point solutions, mm -hmm. to be the point of a point solution, that's a tough call. <laughs> Not going to go well. All right, Rich, I'm throwing this to you. What did you think of this list? Were there any you disagreed with? And what were the ones that stood out to you? Yeah, no, I I totally agree, I think, with what you guys were saying and what Mike was saying about being a feature versus a product or versus a platform. But I think one of the challenges is that everybody knows and, you know, you read any sort of advice you get as a startup, you need to have maniacal focus. You've got to be really, really targeted and you can't try and do too much. And yet you need to be not just a feature, you need to be a product or a platform. And so how do you sort of bridge that gap? And I think the key is you got to start small, but have a plan for how you're going to dominate the world, right? You know, why does being being great and being adopted for even that feature, something small, take you to something bigger? And I think the best example of this I've seen, even though it's not very popular these days to reference Elon, I think you look back at his master plan for Tesla for 2006. Hey, we're going to start with a super fancy, expensive roadster, but that's going to give us scale. That's going to give us the ability to produce at lower and lower unit costs. I think that's a great example, I think, of having thought that through of how how you go to something small and focused and niche into something larger that can really take it to the next level. And was there anything that you disagreed with? So? There was. And I think you can worry too much about competitors. And so just looking at the market, reading one too many analyst reports, I tend to think personally that that could be a mistake. And sort of the, the center of gravity has to be talking to customers, has to be talking to the people who are actually operating, who are you're going to buy your product. I think that is the key to success. And sometimes you have to ignore whatever that Gartner report was that talked about all the different things. And you have to ignore what all the competitors are doing and even ignore like, hey, what if this competitor decides this is a really good idea and comes to stomp us? Just do your thing, keep your head down and understand the customer problem. That's the recipe for success, I think. Yeah, worrying about the competition, it's actually not going to make your product any better. Exactly. How can we secure new technology without creating new risks? For all the potential we've seen from generative AI tools, there's also a lot of fear about how these tools will impact cybersecurity. Sravish Sridhar explains some of the common fears, things like data leaks and generic information in a recent piece for SC Media. Now, a recent Reuters Ipsos poll of U.S. workers found that only 22% of employers explicitly allowed using tools like chat GPT at work, with 10% saying the tech was banned. Now, we're seeing some big names putting out blanket bans like Samsung and Procter & Gamble, but as Matthew Sullivan of Instacart noted on LinkedIn, we have a long history of companies wanting to ban new technologies, but the users keep pushing for it because it's so desirable. So I'll ask you, why does this keep repeating itself with the attitude, but this time it's going to work? This time the ban's going to work. They're not going to be able to use the product they want to use. What do you think, Rich? Yeah. David, I, I think you answered your own question here. It's <laughs> I totally agree. You, you do not put the genie back in the bottle. And I, I'm actually a huge fan of all the, the really fantastic things I think that LLM's AI is going to bring to workers and to companies. It's going to be a tremendous source of value. And so I, I think it is that it's that initial fear of like, how do we handle this? What are we going to do? And, and that's the there's a knee jerk reaction to say, let's ban it. That said, I think those bans are really about public large language models, like the public version of ChatGPT. I was recently at an event with a ton of CISOs, and this came up in conversation just out in the hallway. Every single one of them was doing a test of the enterprise version, something like Azure for OpenAI or some sort of internally focused large language model trained on internal company data. I think that is going to be where tremendous adoption occurs because you can get the benefits without 
worrying as much about leaking data, mixing company data with public data. I think there, there's going to be a huge uptake in that. But I agree. It's, it's So you really have to distinguish between the public versions of ChatGPT and the internal enterprise versions of these internally trained large language models. But I will argue, and I had just posted this video of Sunil Yu, and I'm going to bring this Sunil Yu video up many times because I love what he said. And he referred to CISOs being the CFOs of IP, that they need to learn how to spend it to get value back. And it may be putting it into a public space. Mike, what do you think? I, well, one of the things I wanted to call out is I really want to highlight what Rich said there about public chat GPT versus enterprise. And it relates to what Sunil's had to say, which is this market is moving so quickly. Yes, crazy fast. I actually wonder when this poll was taken, if the enterprise version of chat GPT even existed. That's how quickly things are moving. And so the question that was asked might not really be what we're facing today. Are people looking at banning posting intellectual property into public models? Probably. That's probably a pretty safe thing for people to be looking at. But I do think it really does come down to how do you get the value out of your intellectual property? A lot of that is with your internal usage where you can have a sense of looking and leveraging that data safely. But maybe there are some external uses for maybe some of your intellectual property. There might be value of actually training public models on that. So Neil's point is interesting that you had this initial in the age of search engines, it was, well, just put your content out there. Google will find it and that will be great. Mm -hmm. Then there was search engine optimization became a thing. And then there was the, the concept of black search engine optimization. That was the term that was used of posting your data in ways to get it indexed that was not necessarily up with the terms of service of Google. And so I kind of thinking about what Rich was saying and what Sunil was saying, how do we see people inserting their own intellectual property into these public models so that it does get added into the answers? So that you now have, someone is asking, hey, what is the best recipe for macaroni and cheese? And the next thing you know, you're getting recommendations for which brand of cheese to buy, which noodles to go buy, not just the actual recipe. So I think there's an interesting thing there of the confluence of feeding your own information into these public models. Right. And this was this whole idea that CFO spends money to get value back and the idea that CISO can spend IP to get value back. Same concept here. I, I would argue that it's not the the CISO's choice and the CISO's decision to actually decide what intellectual property should go into the public. Good point. But that's certainly a conversation that a CISO should be a part of and maybe even leading internally into the company. 75% of breaches happen because of bad permissions that cannot be detected by traditional identity governance and administration or IGA tools. For example, traditional IGA tools fail to detect roles based as read-only that in fact grant permissions to edit PII data or users and admins created locally with an SaaS app bypassing the IGA system. That's because traditional IGA tools cannot track granular permissions across enterprise data and applications. Vesa, that's our sponsor, is the next generation IGA platform that manages individual permissions across all cloud, on-premise, and hybrid enterprise systems and applications. Vesa supports the full life cycle of identity management from creation to monitoring to reviews and offers over 100 integrations, ah, our audience likes that, with platforms like AWS, GitHub, Salesforce, SharePoint, and Snowflake. The Vesa Open Authorization API makes it quick to connect to any cloud on-premise and hybrid system. Now, companies like Expedia, Intuit, and Blackstone use Vesa to streamline audit prep, entitlement certifications, and user access reviews, as well as to find and fix bad permissions, enforce security policies, and to continuously update every permission 
to maintain least privilege. That's what we like. Head to Vesa.com. Let me spell that for you. V-E-Z-A dot com to learn more. It's time to play What's Worse? All right. Staying in the theme of ChatGPT, that is where today's topic is. And I think you guys have both brushed upon it. Rich, are you familiar with this game that we play What's Worse? Only a little, but uh, hit me. All right. It's not going to be difficult for you to understand. Two scenarios from our audience submitted. They both stink. But you have to tell me which one is the worst scenario. And it's a risk management exercise. Mike, are you ready? Well, first I have to ask, did ChatGPT write these? No, but we have (laughs) toyed with that before. (laughs) Great. (laughs) We have toyed with that. This comes from Neil Saltman, who looks a little bit like ChatGPT. He works for Armis. And here's the scenario. What's worse? Finding out users have shared sensitive data in LLMs like ChatGPT, violating GDPR and other data sharing guidelines, or sensitive data was shared publicly on a website, but then removed within an hour. Someone definitely saw it because it was reported, but it's not clear if it was copied or distributed anywhere else. Which one is worse, Mike? So what's what's interesting, I think what Neil's trying to get at is... The fact that you share something with a public LLM model doesn't necessarily mean that someone is going to receive that. Right. You don't know. It could stay invisible forever. Right, right. Or not. <laughs> and then the the second one, the, the scenario is, well, it was definitely exposed just for a very short period of time. Mm-hmm. That That's kind of how he's he's getting at. And you don't know if it, if it went anywhere else. The issue is... It doesn't matter if somebody saw it, if it was shared outside of your own promises that you're making to your customers. Oh, then you got your your legal troubles. But you have legal troubles in both cases, by the way. But that again, the the point here is from a legal troubles perspective, they're actually identical. Yes. Even if you're trying to say, well, it was seen versus not seen, that's not the issue. So the reality is in terms of what you're going to then share with your customers and and trying to have those conversations, you look at how long was it exposed and can you actually delete it? Can you remove it? Removing data that's actually been shared into a public LLM, pretty close to impossible. I don't know how it's done. I think you'd have a really hard time convincing OpenAI to delete something that had been shared. But in the second scenario, it's very possible it was deleted because someone saw it, you saw it, you took it down, but you don't know for sure. Right. And and what you're having to communicate to your customers is, in the second case, it was shared, it's been removed, it could have been viewed, we're not sure, we're terribly sorry, so on and so forth. And then would you please add security and privacy are very important to I it. was trying very hard not to say that. Uh, I said it for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. In, in the first case, you can't actually go to a customer and say, hey, the data has been deleted. You actually cannot say that. And so I really think in these two scenarios, the, the public LLM model is the worst of the two because you're actually having to go to a customer and say, I don't know, might get out there. No, no, not sure. Uncomfortable. Well, you're kind of saying that in both scenarios. All right, I'm throwing this. So you say the the LLM is far worse. All right, Rich, I want you to parse this one out. Which one is worse of the two? I'll take the other approach. I, I actually say that posting up on the public site is worse because having to back it out and even say, oh, but it was only up for an hour. You just look like a complete weasel. Like, so there's, there's not really, <laughs> there's, there's no defense for that. Plus, I was actually at a, a conference around InfoSec for AI and some of the some of the frontier AI labs were there. It was actually the day after Black Hat. And I was having this conversation with someone who runs so the AI infrastructure from one of the very, very large AI companies. And she mentioned that they are actually, we, we talked about this exact topic. She mentioned they're actually doing hashes of every single piece of data that comes in. They're recording that hash and linking it to the training of the model. So some of these labs actually already do have the capability to actually pull individual pieces of data 
under the expectation that they're going to start getting these kinds of requests for copyright for GDPR, and they're they're ahead of the game. And I think I think that may be easier than we give it credit for to actually pull out certain types of data because of the, this hash table lookup. There actually is a is a path forward. At least I'm <laughs> n equals one example of uh, someone at a, at a large lab. Well, let's hope this is what you're describing is moving at the speed that the rest of ChatGPT is moving at. One of the things I was just at Black Hat. And when I was at Black Hat last year, the person who introduced me to these AI image generators, specifically Midjourney, was my cameraman from last year, who I hired again this year. This was from last year. And I and I mentioned that to him. I go, you're the one who, who pointed it out to me. And a year later has passed, and the amount that that one program, again, it's AI imager, has drastically changed. And I, I just don't know if I've seen the speed of any other technology move at this rate. Rich, I mean, have you seen anything move this fast? No, I, th- I think it's it's not only the rate, but it's also seems to be, at least from the outside, completely unpredictable. It goes almost as a step function. And you see this as, you, as you're following it, some of the things from DeepMind and reading about AlphaGo and well-informed people were thinking it was going to be 30 years before AI can actually win at these things. And then all of a sudden it's here. I think that's been the thing that's been most surprising is that it's very unpredictable and you have these spikes of rapid advances of capability. So it's a little bit fascinating and wonderful and a little bit terrifying at the same time. What is it for you, my quick, fascinating, wonderful or terrifying? Oh, I think it's both simultaneously. I mean, it, the capabilities and the what we can potentially do with it are both, hey, this could be awesome or, hey, this could be really, really difficult for us to deal with. So I I think it is fast moving in a way that I haven't seen something like this that that I can recall. Yeah, it is fast. And it's exciting that like something changes every two weeks. Yeah. And a lot of it comes down to the fact that it is so approachable. Even my mom could use it. Exactly. You know, Rich had mentioned DeepMind and that was That's deep within Google. Nobody else could ever use it. That was the thing that they were doing themselves. And this is something that anybody can go to a chat interface and start actually gaining value from one of these generative AI platforms. Please, enough. No, more. Today's topic is least privilege. Oh my God, we've talked about this I think a couple of times on this show. Have we talked about this on this uh, show? More, more than once. More than once. I'll have to check our, I'll, I'll have to I'll search our site to see if we've checked, mm-hmm. done it more than once. Okay. So Mike, I'm going to ask you, what have you heard enough about with least privilege? And maybe it's something we said on this show. And what would you like to hear a lot more? It's one of those interesting things where I've both heard enough of it's too hard. So don't bother. Or it's easy just to figure out what everyone needs. Like It's this weird thing where I hear both too much. So some people have figured it all out and others are like, you you can't do it. I think the reality is no one has figured it out. (laughs) They're claiming that they have. And they're saying, oh, well, it's just easy. Just do this. And so I really think what I would like to hear more of is genuinely how do we make least privilege happen in an existing running environment. That's key. Without a ton of manual effort and make it work sustainably. Make it something that we can scale. I've already got 14,000 employees to deal with. I can't just throw everything out and then just build a new system that doesn't work. I've got, I'm flying a plane. You got to do this all in midair. Yes. Yes. So that's what I'd like to hear more of is realistically, real world, how do you get there? All right. Rich, I'm going to ask the same question. What have you heard enough about? And would you like to hear a lot more? And can you solve this in midair? Absolutely. I think it is absolutely one of these things that you hear everybody agrees with in principle. Everyone who's listening to this may have actually checked the box to say, do you follow the principle of least privilege in the, any compliance framework? Of course, yes. But when you get down to the, the the brass tacks of how do you operationalize that, how do you actually put that into practice, it is incredibly hard. And I think there's some fundamental reasons for that. One is that when you look at the foundation of role-based access control, of really just doing that, what is actually a role? When you're asking people out in the business to do things like access reviews and to go out and say, hey, is this right? Here are all the people on your team. Here are the roles they have. 
what the hell does super secret admin number two mean? Right. And it's like you're asking a, a director of HR to make that decision. It is just like the, the tools and the process do not fit the problem. And I think that's one of the things is that we've relied a bit too much on this simplifying assumption of just, hey, just make roles, make roles that everybody needs, and then leveraging that. And it's all based on actually, it's even worse than that. It's just the name of the role. And you're expecting everyone in the business to manage based on a naming convention. And it's no surprise that there is terror and gnashing of teeth when you go through these things and access reviews is a universally hated business process. Yeah. Why why would anyone like that at at all? So this is something that Vesa plays around in, in identity. Where are you tackling this that others are just not doing it as strongly, I will say? Yeah, the the first thing is that we really are going and and integrating into the the systems that already exist. So if you look into the problem of authorization. So this is the in-flight reference that Mike was making. Exactly right. Exactly right. Because, yeah, going and trying to re-architect something or, you know, there's some, I've seen plenty of vendors that are going and saying, hey, we have this inline approach. Just go and deploy our thing in the middle between users and the data. Oh my God, <laughs> you know, like who, who in their right mind would do that in production mission critical systems? And this is not going to happen. And so we've taken a much different approach where we essentially embrace that complexity and we help our customers manage the policies and authorization for the systems and the authorization systems they're already using. We're going into those native systems and you can think about VESA essentially as a, at its fundamental layer, it's a way to translate and rationalize all these different systems of authorization because when you go system by system by system, the authorization scheme, because the resources and all the objects that exist in these systems, they're all different. And so it's like each one is this different language. And then you're trying to apply universal policy, or we have CISOs that want to do things like, hey, make sure no contractor in China ever gets access to my customer data. And customer data is across 30 different systems. And so how do you actually implement a policy and implement those tactical controls that make that very simple sounding statement come to a reality? It's incredibly hard, but that's exactly what we're trying to do at VESA. You make a really good point, because I just think about just this whole concept of one company dealing with all the integrations so you don't have to. I liken this to the payroll system I use where I don't have to know any of the tax laws in all of the 50 states. They just deal with it for me. That's right. The sense of relief I get from that is huge. And the sense of relief that's saying, oh, someone whose full-time job is dealing with this integrations and they're doing it for me. How wonderful. Absolutely. One of the great examples I've, I've seen is like even just, you know, we'll go to one system and you go into like AWS and you go into AWS IAM, which is sort of their universal policy system for managing all these things across the 200 different services that live in AWS. The user guide for that thing is 1,200 pages long. <laughs> just the user guide. That's not technical documentation. You can imagine like the complexity of this stuff. And that's just one piece of the overall puzzle. That's not enough. You've got to link it together with identity systems. You've got to link it into ACLs and local permissions. And you got to do it on every single system that you have. It's really tough. Do you want to know all the integrations for every single system, Mike? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's as simple as that. No, not at all. Um so is there anything else, I'm sorry, and I want to give you the, the floor to sort of explain a little bit more with Visa, but is there anything more besides the integrations, the, the key thing being the integrations here to Visa? Yeah, I think it really is that we've started with this fundamental data model, building a, building a graph that connects everything together around permissions. So it goes all the way from user to group to role to policy into each system down to the resource level. And we hook that all up, right? That It's that that fundamental data model that it really is the foundational piece of VESA. And then we built a bunch of products on top of that. But that's the thing that I've really never seen any other company put that together all the way from user, all the way down to resource and permissions. You know, like can a user create, read, update, delete on that particular resource? And then just quickly closing the scale issue, which is very, very big. How are you dealing with scale? It, it is an issue, but it's one we've been able to deploy at, you mentioned in the beginning, customers like Intuit, Blackstone, AMD, Win Resorts, all our customers, we've been able to operate at scale and it can be done. It's not easy, but it's possible. 
And and we actually, we, we spoke with the CISO at Wynn Resorts and he says, this is not something that happens overnight. It's something that does take time. You can't think that there's a magic solution here, but the fact that he's been doing this like for a year, he's in a such a better place today than he was a year prior because you start that journey. Absolutely. You can't, you just can't ignore least privilege. I mean, it's, it would be great if we could just say, oh, it's too hard. Let's move on. But the reality is there's no other way to really get yourself ready for the inevitable breach. I always hear it's not a question of if, it's only a matter of when. You're speaking the language of our audience. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Even before the pandemic, we've been increasingly living in online collaboration apps. So why are organizations still making basic security mistakes with them? On Computer World, Liz and Rosencrantz wrote about some common problems. The biggest is that organizations don't provide central governance on these tools, leading business units to make their own choices, often with little oversight. Actually, I'm going to start with you, Mike, on this. Is this a case of shadow IT or do collaboration apps provide more unique challenges? So first, the term shadow IT. I was listening to a podcast the other day and it reminded me that- Oh, do you listen to others besides this one? I, I do. I do. Mm, my. I mean, there's. <laughs> we only put out, what, 20 hours of content a week, David? You know, I, yes. I, you know I have, I've got some other time. <laughs> Don't you have a job as a CISO as well? Uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> takes the time. I don't sleep, so. All right, well, you're, you're flying planes mid-flight fixing security issues. You must have tons of extra time. There's no time. <laughs> there's no time to sleep. All right, go ahead. So th the comment was made, and, and I totally agree with it, that there's no such thing as shadow IT anymore. It's just IT. Mm -hmm. And we need to figure out how to empower the business. And I think that... A really good example and a good point here was about the need for centralized governance. That really goes a long way to saying, this is our collaboration app. These are the ones that we use. We're going to make these very easy to use, but we're going to also provide the guardrails. We're going to make it difficult for you to make a mistake, for you to accidentally share something to the world. We're going to make that really hard but we're going to make the collaboration actually really easy. And that's the, the problem that I think a lot of people deal with is employees, they see these restrictions as problems to be worked around. They need to share a file with a company that they work with that is a key supplier, a key vendor, a long-term relationship critical to the company and they go and try and share a simple file and they run into walls and they can't use the normal tool. They can't use whatever is the base collaboration tool. So they go and find others. And this is really that opportunity for CISOs to embrace the business, to help out, to make sure that the collaboration tools that we have today that are the anointed ones are easy to use, are meeting the needs of the business. And then you won't have people trying to work around them. You won't have a lot of these problems that are called out. Rich, what you're saying? Mike, I think you hit it dead on the nail here because you really got to get out in front of users. You got to make it easy. And I think the benefit of things like collaboration apps is they're built in with network effects. So you get you once you get to a tipping point, and once you get most of the people on a collaboration app, your problems with so-called shadow IT go away because it becomes so much more valuable to get on the same universal standard there. So I think it's it's absolutely right. I think the days of finding things out of compliance and shutting them down, it feels like those days are long gone. It basically is a, it's an indication that like, hey, my users need something else. Let's go find a most secure solution that can meet those needs and get out in front of it. But the, the days of shadow IT are that was a decade ago. I think <laughs> worrying about that stuff is uh, is a thing of the past. Well, it's just the way IT operates. I mean, this goes back a number of years ago, but I went to the AWS reInvent conference and I was interviewing people and I asked them a question about their IT department and half, at least half, and again, it was AWS reInvent, it was that half of the people said, what IT department? Doesn't even exist for them because they were fully cloud-based. Exactly. For that matter. But 
the thing is, is that we have a long, long history of using collaboration tools that are keeps evolving. And I'll quote something that Clay Shirky says, the reason like we run into these problems of information overload or too much email or whatever the, the whatever communication tool you're using is because the filters break down. They stop working. And it may be just the way the communication is coming in. He also pointed out, We've had the information overload issue since the Gutenberg Press. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not new to the internet. It's been around a while. All right. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining me today. Rich, thank you so much for our discussion specifically around least privilege. Actually, it was a really good discussion that we have not had mm -hmm. on this topic about least privilege, mostly around the integration issue, which I greatly, greatly appreciated. I want to thank your company, Vesa. Secure your identity access. Remember, their website is VEZA.com. Rich, I'll let you have the last word. Mike, any last thoughts? Rich, thank you for joining us. It was great conversation back and forth. I learned a lot. I learned some more about generative AI, which every day goes by. Happy to learn more. What I really wanted to call folks attention to, though, was back at the beginning of the show, we're talking about why startups fail. And you made the point that it's critical to understand the customer problem. And I really think if, if that's something that one thing that you can take away from this show is understand the customer problem, either as a vendor selling things to, to CISOs or as a CISO who's working with your own company. Understand what your company's problems are and help solve those. And so thank you for that particular insight. And thank you for joining us. It was wonderful having you on the show, Rich. Rich, any last thoughts? And we always ask, are you hiring? Thanks, David and Mike. This has been a real joy here. I've had a, had a great time. I think my, my takeaway here is just to encourage everybody, embrace the large language model. Start looking into it. If, you're, if you don't think your company is doing it, you probably should look harder because someone's probably doing it in some corner of the organization. It's not something that's going to go away. It's not something I think that any CISO is going to be able to keep out of an organization. It's coming. Get ready and, and be ready. And absolutely, we are hiring. Come to the website and we are in growth mode. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you to Rich. Thank you to Mike. And thank you to our audience. We greatly appreciate your contributions and listening to the CISO Series Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. We have lots more shows on our website, CISOseries.com. Please join us on Fridays for our live shows, Super Cyber Friday, our virtual meetup, and Cybersecurity Headlines Week in Review. This show thrives on your input. Go to the participate menu on our site for plenty of ways to get involved, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at david at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Series Podcast.